Sorry for the interruption there, unforeseen circumstances. So we're in the process of discussing the consequences of hypercholesterolemia, and we were actually currently discussing the most important of these, which is atherosclerosis. So in atherosclerosis, cholesterol deposits form in the tunica intima layer of the wall of blood vessels. This impinges on the lumen of the blood vessel and reduces blood flow to the end tissue. When this occurs in the blood vessels that supply the heart, it leads to ischemic heart disease. When it occurs in the blood vessels that supply the brain, it leads to cerebrovascular disease. The blood vessels in the legs, it leads to calf claudication, also called peripheral vascular disease. The blood vessels in the kidneys, it leads to chronic kidney disease. The message here is that atherosclerosis is not good. It gets even worse, I'm afraid. The atherosclerotic plaques, which is the name for these cholesterol deposits, they can actually break open, they can rupture open, and when they do, blood clots will form in the lumen of the blood vessel on top of the surface of the ruptured plaque. That is called thrombosis, and that thrombus, the name, the official name for the blood clot, can completely occlude the lumen of that blood vessel, completely cutting off blood supply to the end tissue. Tissues that do not get a blood supply will die, and that is called infarction. Infarction means death due to lack of blood supply. When that occurs in the heart, that is a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. When it occurs in the brain, it is cerebral infarction, a stroke. Not good, not good at all. Massive risk factor for atherosclerosis is having too high LDL cholesterol concentration because it is LDL that is the lipoprotein that delivers cholesterol into atherosclerotic plaques. So if you are hypercholesterolemic, which we have already discussed means in actual fact that your LDL cholesterol is too high, um, you will develop accelerated atherosclerosis and it is now estimated that 50% of people in the Western world will die because of consequences of atherosclerosis. So that is why doctors get worried about hypercholesterolemia. That is why we put lots of people on drugs to bring down their LDL cholesterol concentration, to bring their total cholesterol into a normal range. So, that is atherosclerosis, the doom and gloom bit over. We are now going to discuss the other consequences, which we have some nice pictures of here. These are not dangerous, they are interesting, and they are things that you can look for to get an idea of when you are doing an examination of someone, whether they may well be hypercholesterolemic and therefore at risk of developing atherosclerosis. So we will begin with the eyes up here. This is the one that you are most likely to see. These two down here are much rarer and require usually you to have very, very elevated uh, cholesterol level and therefore are usually only seen in familial hypercholesterolemia as opposed to the much more common idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So the eyes, one of these is normal, one of them is not. It is the one on the right that is normal. This one is not normal. And the thing that is not normal is this arc around the outside of the cornea here. This is known as a corneal arcus. So I'll write this up here. It's got other names as well. This is a corneal arcus. You can also call it an arcus senilis. So I'll write that down as well. Other name for it is arcus senilis. Most people just call it corneal arcus. Arcus senilis is a little bit rude because senilis comes from senile, which is an old word that meant elderly, but is now used more to mean demented. Um, so I wouldn't use arcus senilis, but you may see it written like that in pathology textbooks. Corneal arcus is a nicer uh, way of putting it. Also, when you put it in the reverse order like that, arcus senilis, it sounds quite sort of... Um, conceited. Um, so corneal arcus is a nicer name. And what has happened here, this ring around the outside of the cornea, is where cholesterol has deposited in the peripheral part of the cornea. So it's not actually in the iris, the covered part of the eye, it's in the cornea that covers the iris. In the peripheral part of the cornea you've had cholesterol deposited, which is why you have this sort of uh, milky white appearance here. And I've tried to get an eye of similar colour here to show you what it looks like without a corneal arcus. 
And the reason, by the way, that it was called Arcus Senilis is because the most common people that you will see this in is elderly people with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. It's not a particularly rare sign. You will see, if you look at enough people's eyes, you will see elderly people with corneal arcuses. Um, young people with corneal arcuses, you get much more worried because that usually means familial hypercholesterolemia. So young people should not have this. Older people often do have it, and it means that they've most likely got idiopathic mild hypercholesterolemia. But young people, red flag, not good. Um, so that is one sign of hypercholesterolemia, a cholesterol deposit in the peripheral portion of the cornea. Now let's come down to these two down here. As I say, these are much, much rarer and usually only occur in people with really severe hypercholesterolemia and idiopathic hypercholesterolemia does not usually get severe enough to cause these. Usually, these are seen in people with familial hypercholesterolemia. So, they have big names. Again, they are cholesterol deposits. In the case of the ones around the eyes here, these are underneath the skin in the soft tissue and these are known as xanthelasma. So it's these, in case you haven't spotted it, it's these that we are worried about here, these sort of um, creamy um, deposits here, and these are underneath the skin deposits of cholesterol, and around, and they're classically seen around people's eyes in the position as shown here, and they have this special name, they are called xanthalasma, and they are a rare sign, you will not see many people with these. This deposit that we've got in this picture, this is actually the Achilles tendon here. This is the back of someone's uh, leg. The, the foot is down here, and this is the Achilles tendon coming from the uh, gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. Now, these are the abnormalities here, these lumps, and again, these are deposits of cholesterol, and this time they're actually deposited in the um, tendon sheath around the Achilles tendon, and they are called tendon xanthomas. Again, very rare. And you can get these on lots of different tendons. It's not just the Achilles tendon that you can get them. You can also get them on tendons uh, in the forearm. So you might see uh, tendon xanthomas in the forearm on those uh, tendon sheaths. Um, and other tendons also can be affected, but the classic one would be the Achilles tendon and the tendons in the uh, forearms. And again, this is a very rare sign and would only be seen in people with really severe hypercholesterolemia. So there we go, consequences of hypercholesterolemia. The ones to absolutely know about are atherosclerosis, because that is actually why we worry about it. These are not dangerous. They might not be particularly um, pleasant looking, but they are not dangerous. Atherosclerosis is the dangerous complication of having hypercholesterolemia. One of the signs that you can look for for hypercholesterolemia when you're examining someone, if you are indeed a healthcare student watching this, is you can look at their eyes. Do they have one of these corneal arcuses? And you will see elderly people, I promise you, you will see elderly people with uh, these. It's not that rare. If someone has these, xanthalasma or tendon xanthomas, you should get much more worried because they are much, much rarer signs and they usually mean that someone has really, really severe hypercholesterolemia, maybe familial hypercholesterolemia. So let's now talk then about these two different forms of hypercholesterolemia, idiopathic and familial. So we'll begin with idiopathic. So Idiopathic is another fancy medical word, and it means that we do not know why it happens. So lots of conditions in medicine are idiopathic. Many people have essential hypertension, high blood pressure, also called primary hypertension, that we do not know why they have it. You can also call that idiopathic hypertension. So when someone has a condition and we do not really understand why they've actually got that condition, we call that condition idiopathic. So idiopathic hypercholesterolemia is a really fancy way of saying you have high blood cholesterol level and we do not actually know why. What we do know is that there are certain risk factors for developing idiopathic hypercholesterolemia and the two biggies are age, so getting older, and I said that earlier that lots of old people get idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, and the other one is weight. If you are larger, 
um, higher BMI, you are more likely to have idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, unfortunately. And of course, you can't do anything about your age, um, but you can do something about your weight. So if you do have too high blood cholesterol, one of the things that you can try doing to bring down your uh, blood cholesterol is losing some weight. Um, in addition, trying to reduce dietary cholesterol is a good idea if you do have uh, hypercholesterolemia. Um, but it's, it's, this is actually an important discussion. Um, with regards to idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, reducing dietary cholesterol is of course advisable. But often we find that it has very limited efficacy, which you may find surprising um, considering that it's one of the main inputs of cholesterol. However, we do feel that in this condition, idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, that it may more be a problem with the liver's de novo synthesis, the liver synthesizing too much de novo cholesterol rather than you consuming too much cholesterol. So let me just say that again because I don't think I made it particularly clear. In people with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, the two big risk factors for it are age and being overweight. Obviously, one of the things that you can try and do to bring down your cholesterol if you do have idiopathic hypercholesterolemia is to reduce your cholesterol consumption by reducing uh, animal products. However, that's not particularly effective usually at actually bringing the cholesterol down because this disease, which we don't properly understand, and by the way, the biomedical scientists are still working very hard to try and figure out why this happens, it, but it seems to be more an issue with the liver synthesizing too much de novo cholesterol and not responding properly and adjusting its de novo synthesis to adapt for how much gastrointestinal absorption of cholesterol is occurring. So even when people with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia cut down their cholesterol intake, we often find that it doesn't actually lower their cholesterol that much. Of course, do it. It's worth a shot, um, but don't expect it to have brilliant results. Far better is if they try cutting down their cholesterol and also cutting down their overall caloric intake and lose some weight. Then we might see an improvement. Then you might find that their cholesterol actually comes down. But it's the weight loss that seems to be related to the blood cholesterol coming down rather than it being um, the um, reduced cholesterol intake because they've gone on a diet. So I hope that's clear. Obviously, it's advisable if you're hypercholesterolemic to cut down your dietary cholesterol, but unless you actually lose weight, it's unlikely to have a massively significant effect. Right, so idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, it happens in older people, you're more likely to get it if you are a larger BMI. And it is usually mild. So usually in people with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, the range of of total cholesterol level would be between 5 and 7.5 millimolar. If it goes above 7.5 millimolar, you've got to think maybe they've got familial hypercholesterolemia rather than idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. And as I said earlier, the sort of classic number for someone with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia would be 6. And people with this, we do put them on statins to bring down their cholesterol to try and prevent atherosclerosis. And you may well see that they have a corneal arcus due to their idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. It would be very unlikely for them to have these signs. Usually their cholesterol is not high enough for them to get xanthelasma or tendon xanthomas. Okay, so very, very common condition. If you are a healthcare student, if you look in enough old people's eyes, you will see people with corneal arcuses because they have idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. All right, so that's the simple one, because there's not much to say about it, because it's not particularly well understood. Now the more complicated one, genetics, familial hypercholesterolemia then, um, which is often abbreviated to FH for short. So this is a genetic condition. People are born with it. So Children with familial hypercholesterolemia, they will have elevated cholesterol levels. They may well start developing signs like corneal arcus, xanthelasma, tendon xanthomas, especially if they've got the more severe form of familial hypercholesterolemia. And these con the genetic conditions are dangerous because they lead to incredibly rapid atherosclerosis. Um, so let's talk about the genetics of this. So... 
we need to go back and discuss a little bit more physiology in order to understand the pathophysiology of familial hypercholesterolemia. We talked about how the liver packages cholesterol into LDL lipoproteins, puts those into the blood, and then um, these deliver the cholesterol to peripheral tissues. What we need to do is go into a little bit more detail and look at how the peripheral tissues actually take the cholesterol out of the LDL lipoprotein. So for this, let's just draw a little cell here. So this is going to represent a cell. There's its nucleus. Now, on the surface of all cells in your body that need to take up cholesterol, you are going to find a certain receptor for LDL. And this is, receptor has been named very sensibly. It's not been named after the person who discovered it. Instead, it has been named the LDL receptor, or the LDLR for short. And the way in which this works is along comes the LDL. So let's let this represent the low-density lipoprotein here. So here it comes. This cell wants to take up some cholesterol, so it's got the LDL receptor on its surface. What then happens is the LDL binds to the LDL receptor and... We won't go into the full detail of this, but the LDL is then endocytosed inside the cell and all of the lipid molecules inside that LDL, including the cholesterol, can then be harnessed by the cell. But the basics, all we need to properly understand, is that along comes the LDL, binds to the LDL receptor, and this cell is then able to harness the LDL, sorry, the cholesterol inside the LDL. It's able to take the cholesterol out of the LDL. Now, there are genes for this protein. The gene for this protein is present on an autosome, so one of the non-sex chromosomes. So one of the chromosomes from 1 to 22 that you have two pairs of, remember, a maternal and a paternal copy of. That means that you're going to have two genes for the LDL receptor, one on the paternal chromosome and one on the maternal chromosome. Now, I'm afraid I do not remember what chromosome uh, the gene for the LDL receptor protein is on. Neither do I particularly care. It's not important for understanding the pathophysiology, but it is on one of the autosomes, which is important to know, because, of course, if it was on one of the sex chromosomes, it would mean that uh, in boys you would only have one copy of it. In girls, if it was on the X chromosome, uh, you would have two copies of it. And indeed, if it was on the Y chromosome, that would make no sense at all, because then girls wouldn't have a copy of it. But it's not on the sex chromosomes. Forget that discussion. It is on an autosome. So let me just draw a picture over here. Um, so... These two lines are going to represent our two homologous chromosomes that have the LDL receptor. So, if you like, this is a massive great piece of DNA, a massive great chain of DNA. And this is the homologous chromosome. So this can be the maternal one, this can be the paternal one. And let's now mark on the LDL receptor. So, here is the gene for the LDL receptor. Uh, so, you have two copies of it. Now... You can have mutations in this gene that mean that when the protein is synthesized, you end up with a dysfunctional receptor. And this is what is going to lead to familial hypercholesterolemia. Think about this. If we then have a dysfunctional receptor, the LDL is not going to be able to be properly uptaken by the peripheral tissues. It's then going to just end up building up in the blood and go higher and higher and higher so that you will end up hypercholesterolemic. So I'll say this again, familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disease and it is caused by you having mutations in your LDL receptor gene that make the protein defunctional. Now, you can have two different severities of this disease because you can either have a mutation in just one of the genes and then the other one on the homologous chromosome is absolutely fine, or you can have, or you can be very unlucky and have mutations in both genes, um, and therefore both of them are defunct. Both of them are producing LDL receptors that are not going to work properly. So these two different severities of the disease are called heterozygous and homozygous. So heterozygous is where the two genes are different. So one of them has the mutation and is defunctional, and one of them is doesn't have the mutation and is working. Hetero means different, of course. And homozygous, homo means same, and 
homozygous is where both genes are going to have the mutation and be defunctional, be producing LDL receptor that does not work. So homozygous is the more severe form of familial hypercholesterolemia, heterozygous is less severe. So in heterozygous, generally they end up with a hypercholesterolemia that is within the range of 5 to 13 millimolar. And, ooh, whoops, didn't manage to fit that on the page, but never mind. Uh, you can see the important bit, which is the numbers. So usually the range of cholesterol for someone with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is usually between 5 to 13. And remember, that's the less severe form. Whereas in homozygous hypercholesterolemia, this is really awful, and they end up with a hypercholesterolemia that's usually greater than 13 millimolar. Now, what is the prognosis then for children born with these uh, form with this genetic disease? Heterozygous isn't so bad. They will develop accelerated atherosclerosis if their cholesterol level is not controlled by medical therapy. And even if we do give them medical therapy, usually we don't manage to get their cholesterol completely back into the normal range. So they are going to develop accelerated atherosclerosis and individuals with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, usually at present, they are going to start developing massive complications of this, i.e. heart attacks, strokes in their 40s, 50s. So they're going to have premature, um, severe consequences of cardiovascular disease. Homozygous, I'm afraid it's worse. They develop accelerated atherosclerosis even more so, and they generally start having heart attacks and strokes even in their late teenage years. Uh, they can start having those. Uh, so really, really unpleasant genetic condition. And because their cholesterol levels can go so high in familial hypercholesterolemia, they can develop signs like xanthalasma and tendon xanthomas. Now, how common then are these conditions? Well, heterozygous is actually more common than you might think. Homozygous is thankfully extremely uncommon. So heterozygous is one in every 500 people, it is estimated, has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And these are the people who are having heart attacks in their 40s and 50s generally. So if you do you see someone in the hospital who's having a heart attack and they're, let's say, 49, you might think maybe we should measure their cholesterol level or maybe I should do an examination, look for corneal arcus, look for xenthalasma, tendons, anthomas, and maybe we should measure their cholesterol to see whether they might have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia because that might be the reason that they have developed uh, this disease so young because usually people don't get heart attacks until their 60s, 70s. In the hom homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is extremely rare. It's one in a million people has this. So you're very unlikely to see someone with that. But it is really, really horrendous when it happens. And as I say, these are teenagers, late teenagers, 20-year-olds who are going to start having heart attacks and strokes. So not nice at all. So let's just summarise what we've uh, talked about here then. So we talked about the definition of hypercholesterolemia. We said that Normal total cholesterol level is between 3 and 5 millimolar. Hypercholesterolemia is when it's above that. And remember, the type of cholesterol that actually goes up is the LDL cholesterol, even though we don't actually call it hyper-LDL cholesterolemia. But if we were to give it a more correct name, that would be what it actually is, because it's LDL going up that is responsible for uh, the rise in total cholesterol. This has bad consequences, I'm afraid. Atherosclerosis is the really dangerous one, leading to heart attacks and strokes. Some more uh, harmless consequences, interesting signs that you can look for, are the corneal arcus, which is usually present in people with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, uh, and then these much more severe, rarer signs, xanthalasma and tendon xanthomas, that you're unlikely to see in people just with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia, but which, if someone has uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, of which the more common one is heterozygous, milder hypercholesterolemia, um, you may well see those signs. We then discuss the two different types. Idiopathic occurs in older people. You're at higher risk of getting it if you're higher BMI. And one of the key things that you can try and do to lower your cholesterol by yourself is lose weight. Usually it's a mild hypercholesterolemia, so it's between 5 and 7.5 millimolar. If it goes above 7.5 millimolar, uh, you should really consider maybe this is familial hypercholesterolemia. Familial hypercholesterolemia 
you will have it from birth, so this will affect children. Um, and the cause of it is mutations in the LDL receptor gene, which is an autosomal gene, so you have two copies of it. You therefore have two severities of the disease, heterozygous, where just one gene is taken out, and homozygous, where both genes are functional. Heterozygous isn't as rare as you might think. One in 500 people is estimated to have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Homozygous is phenomenally rare, one in a million. Range for heterozygous is between 5 and 13 millimolar. In homozygous, it gets so severe that it's above uh, 13 millimolar. Prognosis, heterozygous, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, they're going to have premature heart attacks and strokes, 40s, 50s. Homozygous, they have incredibly premature heart attacks and strokes, late teens, early 20s. If you see a young person with a corneal arcus or indeed with xanthelasma tendon xanthomas, you should think maybe they have familial hypercholesterolemia, they need to have their cholesterol measured. And the treatment for all of this is going to be statins to try and bring down cholesterol. They're usually very effective in idiopathic hypercholesterolemia because it's only mild. They can be very good in heterozygous. Homozygous, it's much more difficult to bring it under control, but we can have a go. And we'll talk about statins in the next part.